Wait, wait, give me one chip. Oh, oh. Hey everybody, today we're reading An Astronaut's Guide to Life by Colonel Chris Hatfield. And this is a book about space. It's about Chris who did all kinds of crazy stuff. You probably saw his killer YouTube video, Major Tom, Ground Control, ringing out a uh, washcloth, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, what do you guys think of this book? This is an interesting book. So, I was a little underwhelmed by the book. So as far as um, Colonel Hadfield, really impressed with him. Um, the things that he's done, nobody has anything bad to say about it. His YouTube videos are awesome, but as a book that's just um, for the average Joe to just pick up and read, um, not terribly interesting. I think the kind of people that would be interested in this would be space buffs, people <laughs> who are really, really into NASA or um, the, uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab up in um, Pasadena. People just love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or people who have a long-term goal that's really big, really audacious, it's way out there, like you want to be the CEO of Walmart one day. That's sort of what it's like to be an astronaut, where the odds are really against you. Um, there's sort of a regimented system of how to get there. Um, and you can draw inspiration from this book if um, if that's who you are. For the rest of us who are kind of, I don't know, I feel like we're feeling around in the dark, sorting our way out through life and don't necessarily know exactly where we want to end up. We don't know that, you know, when I'm in my 30s or 40s, I want to be a, a NASA shuttle commander or I want to live on the International Space Station. Uh, I think this book resonates less with us. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Now, Brian, you said if you're a space buff, now, good band name, by the way. <laughs> it's a solid band name. I've seen Space Jam. Would you reckon? Wait, I've read the book already. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Brian a little yeah. bit. Um, What's the Space Jam reference? You Michael ever seen Jordan? Space Jam? You said no, I never Sp did, actually. Oh, God it's a Michael me. Jordan movie. We'll put a link in the show notes. I think it's... it was out about the same time as the Jetsons movie, and I opted to see the Jetsons movie instead. You Lateral could. move. Yeah. <laughs> both space, yes, both space, space based. Related, not that great. Yeah. But um, yeah, to speak to Brian's point, I think I think it's true. I think the the people who will resonate with this resonate that this book will resonate with the most are those people with those long term goals. Mm -hmm. um, Colonel Hatfield talks about when he was nine years old and he knew he wanted to be there one day and he knew the odds would be stacked against him. So he started you know training like an astronaut would from the time he was nine, reading everything being in physically awesome shape and the whole deal. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it, uh, there was it, there some parts that were kind of dragged a little bit, kind of maybe got a little buried in, I don't know, I want to say minutia, but, you know, kind of, he just kind of yeah. kind of dragged along. With that said, though, I think it did have some really interesting and even provocative sort of life lessons. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I agree. It's, you know, as I was saying, I think by and large most people don't have a clear understanding of what they want to do when they're nine and then fulfill that way later on down the line. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are still figuring that out even at you know, 30, 40. See, that's what, and that's exactly mm -hmm. what didn't resonate with me. When I was nine, right? what, what did I want to do? I can't even remember what I wanted to do when I, think I was nine. I wanted to be a vet, I think, when I was nine. Um, I may have wanted to be an astronaut, but like a rock star astronaut. Yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was four. Because it's like a cowboy. <laughs> rock star, astronaut, cowboy. I think that was the... But you, know, you have kids. Do, do any of your kids, the aspirations they have now, yeah. do you think that they would have actually have a possibility of, of fulfilling those later on? I think as parents, we do a little bit of like shepherding our kids towards... Mm -hmm. We see this in you. You really One of our children really loves animals. And so we sort of say, hey, you might like to be a vet. But um, it's hard to say, you know, that it, there's, there's a difference between liking petting animals and wanting to cuddle with them and have them as a pet and, and wanting to be a veterinarian who's doing surgeries and, I don't know, giving dog enemas or you know, whatever <laughs> it is that do. Yeah. So, and that's why I think a lot of times um, your aspirations as a child or the aspirations that parents try to nurture 
aren't necessarily right on target. That's why I think, yeah, Colonel Hatfield is, um, I think he's a bit more of an anomaly where he knows yeah. what he wants to do when he's mm. nine. He works his whole life towards that, um, you know, even picking the, the school and the university and, and various jobs and training assignments that are all, you know, there's this, this, this um, semi-defined ladder that you climb mm. up. Most of us, I don't think we have that, where we're climbing this clear ladder. Most of us are just kind of figuring out the next yeah. step. You know, like we know generally we want to do something in this type of field over yeah. here, but I feel like most of us get there and we're like, you know, it wasn't quite that thing I wanted to do. There was this little part of it that I really liked, yeah. and now I'm going to take that little part and jump over to this other area. So I think for a lot of us, it, there's so much discovery that, that this long-term planning and training towards a single goal just doesn't resonate. Mm. Let me let me touch on that, because I think you brought up an interesting point about success and how you define success. So I think he he started off by saying, I really want to be an astronaut, but if I don't get there, it doesn't mean I'm not successful. And I think I really like that attitude because, you know, like we're saying, we're, we're trying to figure out what direction we want to go, what we want to do, and I think if you pin your success on just, I want to be this, and that doesn't happen. Yeah, having a more of a results-oriented mindset. Yeah, because if you if you want to be if you want to be an astronaut and don't make it, like he could, there's so many things he talks about that could have just a little bit different if he was a little bit shorter or a little mm -hmm. bit taller that would have ruined all his hard work. And I think in life, if we have this kind of, if I want to do this and I don't make it, it's the it's this the journey is the reward, not the mm -hmm. destination. And there's so much of this book that's talking about all this training for missions that may never happen, where you're literally training for years on something that you may never ever do. And uh, it's hard training. I was thinking about that, going like, you know, in my own life, the things that would I put all this time into training for a goal that, that I could never achieve, or or outside of my control, not happen. You know? So that, that that was interesting because um, you get you do get this sense that had he never become an astronaut, he still would have been a happy guy. Yeah, he would have yeah. lived a good life. He, you know, he talks about how he really enjoys engineering. He genuinely enjoyed being a test pilot. And one of the sort of questions in the back of my mind was maybe about my life path. Um, if I don't get to some of those end goals that I sort of have mm. for myself, am I enjoying this process enough where, yeah. you know, I'm like, yeah. okay, I could not, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so the economy could crash, you know, 75 million different things could happen to stop me from getting to where I want to go. Would I still be happy and waking up every day enjoying this process? Mm. That's true. Um, I want to touch on a couple other things that he brought up uh, in his book. Um, he had a really cool thing about kind of being a zero, and uh, that sounds like some kind of after-school PSA, but it, it's actually really <laughs> helpful. Um, he, he says to approach every situation as a neutral. So if you're a plus one, you're helping the situation. If you're a minus one, you're hindering the situation. Mm. And uh, I feel like especially in the work world, corporate world, I feel like I work with a handful of minus ones that it's like, oh gosh, this guy's on the project. I'm not mentioning any names because your coworkers might watch this. <laughs> coworkers may be watching, but there is a couple of plus ones. And I think if you are a, a plus one, I think most of the time you're not braggadocious about it. You're yeah. you're there to help and that's you're okay with that. You're you're not looking to get the glory off this project. You're looking to contribute to a bigger thing. And I think that's the the attitude of the plus one. And then there's a handful of zeros which is just being neutral, and I think I'd I'd rather take a handful of zeros and minus ones on my team. That's true. Yeah, aren't those plus ones people who are, you know, sort of enjoying the process? Yeah. And they're like, I, I love being here. I, I kind of have other places I want to go to, but if I don't get there, I'm happy to be right here doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, His other point, I think, too, with the plus one, minus ones, and the zeros, because um, at, at the end of that chapter, he just basically said, you know, I aim to be a zero because the guys that kind of thought of themselves as plus ones ended up being minus ones. Yeah. And so they would come in and kind of be hot to trot and thought they were the best. And um, I think that chapter is where he talked about uh, the, the ass cans, the astronaut candidates. And By the said, way, that's the worst marketing name ever, ass can. We need to <laughs> Welcome aboard, ass can. And uh, these guys would come in and uh, they would come in and, you know, they're all they're all the best in their fields. They're, they're potential astronauts. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the most brilliant, the best pilots. And the ones who came in thinking, oh, I got this in the bag, ended up being the minus ones. Whereas the guys who came in said, you know, I'm just grateful to be here, and I'm just going to work hard. 
mm-hmm. you know, aiming to be a zero, ended up making it and, you know, getting on space flights and yeah. becoming astronauts, so. Yeah, that was, that was earlier in the book, um, where, where he talked about, um, this idea of, um, everybody comes, um, to astronaut candidate training as being the best in, in their own little pond. Mm-hmm. Um, but even once you get there, you know nothing. And even once you graduate yeah. astronaut candidate training, then you're an astronaut. You can go out and tell everybody you're an astronaut. I remember he said, except you're not. Yeah. You're not really an astronaut. That just means that all of the training <laughs> has officially begun once, you're, once you get to call yourself an astronaut. Mm-hmm. And then there's years or decades even of training that still need to happen before you become an astronaut. I mean, it's just, it is a really, really long road. So those guys who came in way at the very beginning of the candidate training, um, who were, you know, years or, or again, decades away, um, thinking that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a plus one, uh, just had the complete wrong mindset for the long haul of being an astronaut. Yeah, true. In, uh, in, the gra- in the Japanese grappling sport of judo, there's a saying that you don't become a real student until you become a black belt. That all the, all the you know, the handful of belts, I don't know if you've done karate when you were a kid at all, yeah. or any kind of martial arts, yeah. but there's a belt system, mm-hmm. you know, white, yellow, etc., etc. Black belt, you go, oh, you're a black belt. Oh, you're, you need to be an expert mm-hmm. and say, well, well, no. It's not even that. You've just now, now you can become a real student. You've learned the basics. Now you can really apply and really learn it, just like these astronauts. Yeah, I think that, so, you know, that whole mentality of being a student and having to learn all this information, it's interesting because they're making literal split-second decisions that will determine their life and the life of everyone else on board, and it's all this learning that they have to constantly do, this learning and training, Um, and, uh, you know, he's in charge of just this segment of of pulling one lever that could mean life or death for a lot of people, and I listened to an interview with with Colonel Hatfield on um, NPR's Fresh Air, I'll post a link in the show notes, but... He talked about that whole situation where he had uh, his visor and he couldn't see. That that to me was like the most terrifying thing. He was saying there's no, there's nothing to feel in space. You're in the spacesuit, so it's kind of like you're floating there, and so you've got you know the sensory feeling is gone, his visual sensory is gone. So basically, all he's got is he can kind of hear and he's got this blurry stuff and he's just kind of floating through space. And uh, it was interesting. He went so long without saying like, hey. Uh, Having a problem. Yeah, a little problem I'm in the going mask. blind up here. Yeah. 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 And it's just weird that it was a little bit of shampoo in his face mask had kind of wound up in his eye. And uh, unlike the movie Gravity, when Sandra Bullock cries and her tears fall down gently. Whoa, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. I haven't seen it. I, it's not, 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 no, not a main plot point. Um, oh, Sandra Bullock. Uh, <laughs> so she's got a little, little tear and it falls down, but in space, the water kind of clings to your face. And uh, there's a video of uh, Hatfield squeezing out like this washcloth, and so it's full of water, he squeezes it, and the water has nowhere to go, it just kind of comes out, then gets sucked right back in. And the same thing when his eyes were tearing up with his baby shampoo and other stuff. Now the water just kind of clings to your face. Yeah, there was nowhere else for it to go, so it's just kind of sitting right there, and it's like, and he did the instinctual, like, touch his mask and try to clear it out, and, you know, you obviously can't touch it, but. Because in space, you cannot touch your face. And no one hears you scream, right? Isn't that the other the B horror movie line? We always B horror. Right. That was the tagline for Alien. Oh, it's Aliens. Oh, that's no, right. No, no, Alien. That? Alien, the first one. Dude, you're getting up your nerd cred right now. I know. I, I totally. That's awesome. what I have very much. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you guys think about all the things he did in his career versus? Because he kind of talked about there's this huge pinnacle of all these magnificent things he's done to now not doing any of that. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Yes. So I think that's <laughs> that's the interesting corollary to those types of careers where there's tons and tons of build up to a to a, a, a huge, really cool job like being an astronaut or being president. Once you get there, there is nothing else on the other side. You can get there pretty young. I mean, you know, with modern science, people can live you know, 80s, 90s, mm-hmm. 100 years old. Even getting there in your 40s or 50s, you could be halfway through your life. Um, I don't know what to say about it, but that is an interesting corollary versus, you know, the way, I, again, that I think that most of us live life is just kind of 
groping around, trying to figure out what's going to happen. I, I really think of it as groping around the dark, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's going to happen next. The nice thing about groping around in the dark is that, um, you know, you're kind of in the state of ignorance, like, hey, the next stage could mm -hmm. always be really, really awesome. You never know when you're going to get there. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I guess I think about the, you know, with his career, and several authors I've, I've heard about talk about this too, is that you reach this point of, this is the best that you will ever do. Uh, and I, I don't know, I feel like that's, he kind of, you know, brushes it off as this is a part of life, but I feel like that'd be weird to go, I've done the most exciting thing I'm ever going to do in my life, and now it's time to write a book, be a consultant, mm -hmm. and it's, I feel like life would not be as exciting. And it, when you say that groping around the dark, there is that kind of, Ignorance is bliss because if your goal, if you're still figuring out the goal, you've got a much longer journey. Where his journey, although it was very planned out, it, it has a very finite timeline, right? It, it cuts off at you know 50 or however, whatever his last mission was. Spoiler alert. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. Something interesting to think about. Would you, uh, in closing, would you, if you could get the money to go to space, if someone gave you a grant and said, "We will pay for you to go to space," would you go? Absolutely. Not only would I go. I'm hoping that in my life, I, it's not even, what I'm trying to say is, it's not just a hypothetical. I'm hoping that in my lifetime, mm -hmm. that I will be able to go to space. So, Derek, would you go to space? Well, yes. Okay. In one word. It's space. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. Because, I mean, think about it. You've been in like a national park, Yosemite or something like this, where there's no lights around, and you can yeah. see a clear night sky and all the stars. Mm -hmm. Now you can be among the stars. Mm -hmm. And imagine how much clearer it is once you clear the atmosphere. And you can look down on Earth. That just sounds amazing. So you just nailed the slogan, the advertising slogan, be <laughs> among the stars. Oh, jeez. Is, is that for Disney or <laughs> Hollywood Walk of Fame? That was the Hollywood bus tour. Or is that actually, for SpaceX? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've got some reservations about going to space. Uh, Colonel Hatfield addresses a lot of like the, this is you know, incredibly dangerous, you could burn up coming into the atmosphere, there could be a pressurization inside the space station, all these awful things could happen to you, but knowing how to prepare for them will kind of get you in the right mental state. All that aside, I think it's, it's dangerous, but I also think after I looked out the window and went, wow, that's really cool, I'd take a couple selfies, and then I'd probably be like, what's going on on Facebook? I feel like the... I could only play with anti-gravity for so long, like I'd be like spinning a quarter around going like... Okay. Yeah, we have TV here. Like, does HBO come up here? Like, I'm missing True Detective right HBO now. Go. <laughs> yeah, HBO Go reach the space station. <laughs> Internet sucks up here. I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of fear that the the newness, the nuance of being in space would get old real quick, and I was barfing into a plastic bag. You know? That's true. Well, and he even mentions in the book, you know, you train for six months if you want to even be a traveler in space. If you even want to, you know, just have a ride along, and you're just a super wealthy person and yeah. want to go right now. So there are two, it seems like there's two kinds of life experiences um, that are around like those momentous type occasions. Mm -hmm. There's one where, you know, like you visit, um, you know, like the Eiffel Tower, someplace you've always seen all your life, and, and, and you're, you do like, okay, now I've seen it, there it is, it's big, it's Checked made of metal, it's got the yeah. selfie, I can put that on my wall to mm -hmm. prove to people that I went to Paris and I, and I am a refined individual. Um, but then there's another kind of experience where it kind of it's it's overwhelming. It changes you, like um, like Yosemite, mm -hmm. or if you've read Lewis's Space Trilogy, he talks about. I mean, it's fiction, but he talks about from the the, the perspective of um, Doctor Ransom uh, when he first goes to space. Um, it's not this blackness and this nothingness. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a void, it's full of light, and it's this over, mm. overwhelming life experience that um, just sort of, I don't know, consumes him, and um, just being in space is absolutely amazing. I do wonder, what would being in space be like, uh, you know, as a tourist at least? Would it be this Dr. Ransom type experience uh, maybe it's not Doctor, just a ransom space trilogy type experience, mm -hmm. or would it be the the you know fifteen minutes of selfies and you're done type experience? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, kind of wrapping this up, would you recommend this book if someone asked you, "Hey, should I read this book?" I'd ask some qualifying questions first. Um, I don't think that this goes on the list of 
everybody needs to read this book um, or you know you're not a decent human being um, I think this goes on the list of this would be interesting reading for a lot of people I'd ask some qualifying questions about your interest and um, your ability to stay disciplined in reading through um, 250 pages to get to some really good lessons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I'll agree with Brian. Um, and I think, too, um, Colonel Hatfield's a, a really type A kind of a guy. You know, when I was what, not... What, what is a type A person? Everyone was like, I'm a type A person. This guy right here. I'm about to define it. Relax. Okay. Mm -hmm. I need to know. Type a. I'm a type, type a, a personality, so you have to tell me. Well, people have told you that, right? <laughs> yeah. No, so I say type A. He's he is the honor roll. He's the valedictorian. Yeah. He's the jet. He's an astronaut. I mean, he he has made it to. I mean, just the upper echelon. He's the cur the, the creme de la creme. Mm -hmm. He is just the cream of the crop. He is at the top of the heap. He's all those things. Um, and I feel like if you are the kind of person who you know, maybe you want one of those voices spoken into your life. I think there's a lot of really good life lessons, like you said. And I also appreciate how uh, most of the chapters have a very clear big idea mm -hmm. in them. And I, I appreciate how he uh, draws parallels and he makes metaphors to, uh, you know, life on Earth. Uh, just really, you know, mundane things in life uh, to things that happen in space. And you get, a, you get a clear picture of both what it was like for him and also uh, what his core values and what really drives him. You know, you get an idea of those things as well. I think that's valuable if you want that kind of uh, input into your life. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, it's all about managing expectations. People ask me, should I watch a movie, should I read a book? And I think it's what are you looking to get out of this book? And um, if you're looking for a book that's all about, you know, how to live the good life or how to solve problems, um, there is some of that in this book, but that's not the whole of this book. This book is a very unique story about um, kind of reaching a lifelong goal and a lot of cool stuff that happened in space. Mm -hmm. Um, with some you know nuggets of wisdom and, and cool stories mixed in and some things that you can apply to your own life. I think if you know that going in, um, you'll enjoy this. But if you're looking for kind of a, you know, Oprah, this is going to change my life forever, um, this isn't that book. And as you were saying, there's a couple of books that I would recommend. Yeah, that would be life-changing. This is not one of them. So maybe one distinction to make, I actually think maybe, maybe it could be that kind of book, but it's not quite as easily accessible in yeah. terms of self-help, like you're mm -hmm. not going to read this, have some huge epiphany, and go out and change your life. I think that yeah. this that this has like a slow drip kind of, um, you know, you need to read a lot of good books over the course of your life to form your character mm -hmm. and become a certain kind of person. Um, having the discipline to read this book maybe goes into that, but it's not going to be an instant like, I just love this book, it was awesome, totally changed my life. You won't get that out of this book. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think this is kind of a. Have you had a little break from books since college, or you know, it's been some time span since you you've held a Kindle or a book? Uh, <laughs> I would say this is probably not the book to to re-energize your reading habit. Um, it's as Brian was saying. There's some parts that are a little little difficult to to access, if you will. It's not it's not an easy reader. You won't sit down and like you know trudge through this thing in one sitting. It's not it's not that kind of book. I think it's a. It's not product. it's not riveting, but it's. But there's it's some worthwhile yeah, things. Yeah, there's some good yeah. stuff. It's just not, it's a, it's kind of, I don't want to say slower read, but it's, you're going to kind of take this in in small sections. It's not a, you know, digest this all at once. You're not going to binge watch this like you, like you do in a, a Netflix show. This isn't House of Cards. This, this is, is more of a. Yeah, this isn't House of Cards. This is like a. It's a documentary kind yeah. of thing. It's a good documentary. It's a good foreign film. Mm -hmm. When you get to the end, you'll be mm -hmm. happy that you watched it. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not going to, um, it's not super fun while you're doing it necessarily. Great. All right, well, guys. Said. Thanks for watching. We'll be back soon with more great book reviews. Flashes in Dan's face. That, that's what this stuff <laughs> I think is good for. This is, I almost might dump this. We're drinking Bluefin. It's uh, so two ninety nine at Trader Joe's. I've had Bluefin. I think that this... The green fin is, is slightly less sugary. Mm, but the red fin really has a... The red fin. <laughs> this is not good wine. I... Ooh, this was a three dollar one. This one is this one is especially not good. But I've had this before. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I've had bluefin before, and it's never been this bad. I don't think it's it hasn't turned. It's just it tastes like it has turned a little bit. Maybe. Mm. I won't know until I drink the whole bottle. Okay, here's what we do. <laughs> We're gonna pour it back in the bottle, and you can return it to Trader Joe's. No. No. Yeah, you can. You can take anything back. 
This is not ethical. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Dan, you should turn the glass over to this side. Oh, there we go, like that? Yeah. Okay. But wait, hold on. Let me do it like... This is how this like is. Reverse aerating. Oh, this is dripping. Oh, wow. That's cool, the way it aerates it. One glass, Dan. This is what they did during the bootlegging days. What do you mean? You just fill bottles with cheap wine. Oh. Not a good year. Restart. <laughs>